So just briefly about Oceanic Institute. Um, this is what it looks like from the air. Um, it was started in 1960, and uh, so we've been around over 50 years. Uh, and part, part of Oceanic Institute used to include Sea Life Park, uh, but in the 70s it was split off from Sea Life Park, so now Sea Life Park is a separate company. And really what we focus on is the aquaculture technology development for shrimp, fish, as well as the feed production. So those are our three primary areas of research. I work mostly in the finfish uh, area of research. Um, in 2003, we started an affiliation with Hawaii Pacific University, and only uh, recently this year actually merged completely with the university. So we're actually part of HPU now, um, not just affiliated. These are some of the species that we work with in the finfish program. Really, uh, what we've been focusing on are the more difficult to rear marine fish species, trying to break down the barriers um, to um, providing alternative means to wild harvest uh, as far as providing an alternative uh, to that. Um, you're probably all aware that the oceans are being fished at their maximum capacity. They can't produce any more fish. Despite our efforts to try to extract more fish, we cannot take any more fish out um, than they can produce. So we've, we've basically reached that point. And so for the world to be able to continue to have fish uh, and a greater capacity, we have to farm them. Uh, and so these are some of the species that we work with, the moi, the amberjack, the trevally, snappers, as well as the uh, coral reef species that are collected for the aquarium trade. Um, uh, that's really important in Hawaii. And so we're working on developing methods for culturing those species. And then looking uh, to the future, to things like tuna uh, and other large pelagic species that uh, would be interesting to culture. To break down uh, the areas of focus for today's presentation, really um, aquaculture of marine fish encompasses all these areas. We have to have the animals to spawn in captivity. You have to have a, a source of eggs to work with. Because the marine fish hatch very small, they cannot eat prepared feeds. So um, unlike the tilapia fry, which you can throw dry feed at them, uh, these marine fish species uh, produce larvae that are very tiny and will not eat dry feeds. Even if you could produce them tiny enough, they still wouldn't eat them. So you have to have live prey for them to eat. So we actually have to culture live plankton and uh, zooplankton for them to eat. Uh, we rear up the larvae. Um, produce juvenile fish, and then there's a grow-out uh, component to make sure you're successful in growing the fish out. And then transporting the fingerlings to their final destination uh, is, another, is another aspect. Um, this was a picture of one of the, ca the cages that we were talking about earlier. Offshore in Hawaii, they uh, have these submerged net pens for culturing the moi and the amberjack. And they've been pretty successful in utilizing this technology. Um, by having the cages submerged, it keeps them out of the surface turbulence during storms. Also keeps them out of people's sight, so um, they're not a, a visual problem or uh, easy to poach from because you have to be a diver to get to them. Um, however, having them submerged underwater makes them technologically challenging to maintain uh, and, and very costly to maintain as well. Uh, so the first uh, on that list was the captive spawning. And so um, just having the animals in captivity doesn't necessarily mean they're going to spawn for you. Um, uh, you have to be very careful with how you acquire the fish. Um, we also um, go through a lot of efforts to quarantine them to make sure we're not bringing in diseases into the facility. Um, we have to work on optimizing the holding conditions because if the fish are stressed, they may not spawn for you. Uh, so having the, the optimum environment, optimum nutrition, uh, preventing disease, maintaining water quality, all of these things are really important in maintaining a broodstock population. Um, and But if you're successful in maintaining a broodstock population, uh, you'll have a captive source of eggs, which is really important to work with. And so at Oceanic Institute, we've worked with fish like uh, milkfish, red snapper, um, uh, yellow tang, moi, and all of these different species have different optimum conditions and different requirements as broodstock. Um, some of them will spawn naturally, like the moi. Um, they actually spawn with the lunar cycle. So about 10 days after the full moon, we'll see egg production uh, in the moi, and they spawn on their own without any influence from us whatsoever. The red snapper require hormone manipulation in order to get them to spawn. 
as do the mullet, some other species we work with. So depending on which species you're working with, we'll, um, may, we'll give you different requirements. So there's different types of reproduction. So I talked about this just a, a little bit uh, in a little bit of detail before, but um, we have fish like amberjack will spawn naturally, as will the moi for us. Uh, however, the moi will change sex. So uh, the population initially starts off as males and will eventually shift to become females. And this is, this is quite common in coral reef species, but that poses a problem. If you have a group of fish that will eventually all become females, you don't have any boys. <laughs> uh, so you need to continually add new uh, fish into that population. Um, the red snapper require hormones, um, so they're a little bit harder to spawn. Um, and there's uh, various fish uh, in between. So in order to maintain the water quality and the optimum conditions for some of these fish, we have a lot of different water and treatment systems. Um, so even though we have flow through seawater uh, at Oceanic Institute, um, not everyone does have that luxury of having flow through seawater. Um, so like at the college in Saipan, we didn't have the option of running flow through seawater, so we had to make a recirculating system that reuses the water. And so if you're going to um, reuse the water, or even if you want to treat the water that's coming from the ocean, there's a lot of systems that are out there that are in place to do that. Things like uh, degassing tanks, which will basically take the gas pressure out of the water. Um, if you have too high of a gas pressure from pumping the water, you can actually get uh, air embolisms in the fish eyes and gills, sort of like the bends the scuba divers get. Okay. Um, we also UV treat the water to kill bacteria or parasites that could be coming in. Um, different types of filtration, um, biological filtration if you're going to be reusing the water. So um, having all of the right systems in place is really important as well. So knowing which species of fish you're going to work with, knowing what's re required to optimize the environment, uh, putting the technology in place before you bring the animals is uh, really important. So this is an example of some of the tanks we have at Oceanic Institute for our broodstock. Uh, our moi, our snapper, trevally have all been uh, housed in these types of tanks. They're basically a 20 foot diameter tank, roughly three feet deep. Um, and these have shade covers over the top just to keep the sunlight to about 20% of the ambient condition light. Um, the effluent flows out of the tank uh, and we can use a net like this to just catch the eggs. So if the fish are spawning on their own, um, the eggs will travel out of the effluent and just get collected in a, in a mesh bag. This is similar to how Mike is collecting them in uh, in Saipan. Uh, we also have tanks that have egg collectors that are a little bit fancier with a fiberglass uh, box where the water flows out the just the side of the tank, but roughly it's the same idea. So I'll talk well, a little bit about amberjack. Uh, I'll just go through a couple species that we've worked with really quick uh, just to give you an idea of the different kind of things to expect with these different species. So this is the amberjack or the kahala. They're culturing these off the Kona side of the Big Island right now for the restaurants in Hawaii as well as the mainland. The really interesting thing about these kahala is that they grow really fast. So uh, this is the fish weight in kilograms and this is the age in months. You can see in just over six months they get to one kilogram. So they grow very fast. That's from egg. <laughs> from egg to uh, six months, one kilogram. And the really interesting thing is that they keep that growth rate for uh, at least the first two years. In uh, one year, they're already two kilograms. 18 months, they're almost three kilograms. So a pretty short time frame to getting a relatively large fish. And uh, this, is, this was onshore growth, and we think that the growth uh, offshore might even be a little bit better. So the one nice thing about working with the fish that grows fast is you can get it to market quickly, okay? Um, the moi, the Pacific threadfin, is another species that we've worked with and developed the uh, hatchery methods for. We rewrote a manual um, so a farmer could basically open this up and uh, all of the things that are necessary from broodstock care, quarantine, housing the broodstock, spawning them, live feeds, everything's right there. So with moi, we've pretty much made a turnkey uh, method for producing these fish. So if anyone has the capacity to do it, the methods are widely available now. So um, the nice thing about moi uh, is that they'll spawn year round. And so uh, this is just some data from uh, almost you know, 10 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, 
that shows uh, year-round production. So the yellow bars are fertilized eggs. Uh, the orange bars are just the eggs that were not fertilized. But you can see pretty much over uh, seven years, we got egg production throughout the year uh, with peaks. And the peaks are in the summer. So they tend to spawn a little bit more in the summer, but they still spawn in the winter. And this is important for a commercial operation because if, if you don't have access to eggs year round, you're gonna have periods of time where you don't have production. So with more, you can have the production year round. Uh, and like I said before, they spawn predictably with the lunar cycle. So that's another important thing when you're culturing marine fish is to know when they spawn. And with moi, we know that they spawn with the lunar cycle for about six or seven days. Um, and this is every month. So you can predictably know when you're going to need your live feeds ready and your hatchery tanks ready because you can kind of expect when the eggs are going to arrive. These are some of the facilities we have at, at Oceanic Institute to rear the fish. Um, smaller hatchery tanks for doing replicated research or larger outdoor hatchery tanks for doing production. And so depending on what uh, level of activity you're going to be doing uh, would dictate the size of the tanks you need. This is some of the water treatment that we have in place. Uh, degassing, um, we have uh, sand filters to take out mechanical uh, removal of solids. We do have a recirculating system if we wanted to recirculate the water. Uh, as well as uh, multiple larval rearing tanks and then mechanical filtration and UV sterilization um, to finalize the cleaning of the water. So having really clean filtered water is important for most marine species of fish. Unlike tilapia that can grow in really kind of varied conditions and turbid uh, conditions with a lot of um, background algae and other things uh, in marine species, they require much cleaner conditions. So the process is kind of sim um, documented here. We have the effluent leaving the broodstock tank into a net. That's how we can collect the eggs. Uh, we look at the eggs under the microscope to assess whether or not they're fertilized or if they look like they're viable. Um, the eggs will start developing if they are fertilized. You can see a viable egg. You can see the embryo forming inside the egg right before it's about to hatch. And when the larvae hatches, um, they would hatch out into a healthy, normal looking fish. Um, I have some other pictures of the larvae uh, coming up, but briefly, most marine fish larvae hatch out very primitive. Um, you can see their, this is their head. They, uh, their eyes are not even completely formed yet. They use a yolk to um, feed themselves for the first few days because their mouth is not open. So they don't eat for the first couple days. They survive on that yolk. Um, and they're very tiny, you know, one to three millimeters in size. Go ahead. Uh, so here we go. This is the uh, early development of larvae. These are some coral reef species, um, but basically the pattern is the same. They hatch out um, dependent on the yolk. By day three, the yolk reserves are pretty much depleted and they have their eyes formed and their mouth open and ready to eat. So it's at this period that they need to have food. And if you don't provide them with the right food uh, in the right period, the two to three day period, they'll basically all die. So with, within that first 24 hours of them being available or able to eat food, you have to have the right food in place. Uh, if they start eating successfully, then they'll start developing and growing. Uh, and, you'll, and you'll see them getting larger. Like I mentioned earlier, the fish larvae are very tiny and cannot eat dry feed. So we have different types of prey items that we've used to rear different species of fish. Um, Artemia are probably what uh, many of you are familiar with, the brine shrimp, the baby brine shrimp, uh, which are sometimes used to culture marine shrimp or other types of larger freshwater fish uh, babies. Uh, this is what an Artemia looks like. Um, they're quite big in size, um, almost a millimeter or half a millimeter in size. Um, rotifers are the next picture up. Uh, the, there's an S-type and a L-type rotifer. That's the commonly used uh, prey item for most marine fish, like the moi. Um, and uh, rotifers are relatively easy to culture. They eat algae and reproduce asexually. So one will become two, two will become four, four will become eight. So they can grow exponentially really quick. So rotifers are fairly easy to culture. Copepods are smaller than rotifers. 
uh, and then ciliates are smaller than copepods. So depending on the fish you're culturing and how big their mouth is, you might need different types of prey. And so this figure just depicts kind of relative scale as far as larval size at hatch. Uh, you can see milkfish, the larvae are relatively big, you know, kind of whales in comparison to our yellow tang larvae. Um, and they, they can eat a wide variety of prey items. Uh, the mullet and the thread fin are um, in the middle. They're the fish that we can rear on rotifers. And then uh, anything below snapper and trevally and angelfish and yellow tang, the coral reef species, are really too small to even use rotifers. We have to use the copepods or the ciliates to rear, to rear them. And so knowing how big your fish are when they hatch uh, will also help you figure out what live feeds resources you need. And so the production of live feeds can be a huge pain in the neck and a huge component of your marine fish hatchery operation depending on what species you're working with. Um, typically live feeds culture will start with algae culture. Algae is the bottom of the food chain and the zooplankton that we feed the fish typically need the algae to eat themselves. So this is what I like to call the food for the food. So you're growing the food for the fish but you actually have to feed the food <laughs> as well. So you start off with algae culture. Um, uh, in some cases, culturing at rotifers, uh, which is the next stage, you can, you can bypass the live algae requirements depending on the species you're working with. Um, they make a commercially available algae paste now, which is a substitute for live algae. And so if you have a species of fish that can eat rotifers, you might be in luck because you might not have to culture live algae. Um, some people still choose to culture live algae because it is um, relatively easy to do in environments like this because you have uh, good sunlight and uh, you just need to give them nutrients and they grow quite easily. But um, it is uh, extra labor. So rotifers um, can be produced using this uh, basically batch systems. You just inoculate a tank with rotifers uh, with say 1,000 rotifers, the next day you'll have 2,000, the next day you'll have 4,000, the next day you'll have 8,000. And so they basically double every day. So if you, um, if you inoculate with a higher enough concentration, you can have an exponential growth quite quickly. Copepods is a different story. Copepods reproduce sexually, so they have their whole, um, their whole mechanism for reproducing, you almost have to go back and do everything we talked about with the fish broodstock. <laughs> and I'll, t I'll talk about that in a little bit. But basically, copepods require live algae. Um, no one's perfected an artificial diet for them yet. So this is the typical larval development for moi. This is what they look like uh, day zero. Basically, the ball of yolk on a stick. And then 25 days later, they're actually a little uh, fry. So a relatively fast hatchery um, uh, period for moi. Uh, and they have, um, you can see their growth rate is pretty fast. Um, they really pick up in the past, in the last part of their hatchery operations because they start eating uh, artemia and grow well. So the hatchery period for moi is about 25 days, uh, which is pretty fast. <clears throat> and this table, it's busy, but it, I just wanted to show you it documents different larval rearing runs in a year and basically shows how many larvae per liter we started with, how many we harvested, um, what, so what that means as far as survival and their approximate weight. And really the numbers to pay attention to are the bottom and particularly the survival number, 30%. Like I said, this is a, a, mechan this is a method that's been worked out and pretty much um, tailored to the point where it can be improved a little bit, but probably not going to be improved much um, on that survival number. 30% survival out of a marine fish hatchery is really good. Um, typically, 40 to 50% would be the best you'd probably ever see. And so a mean survival of about 30% is really, is really good. So um, with moi, we've pretty much hit that number. And that's what I wanted to show you here. A number of the species that we're working with uh, that can't use rotifers need copepods. And Basically, we've, we've identified this type of copepod, Parva calinus, that um, produces an oplii that's small enough for the marine fish that can't eat rotifers to eat. So it's the babies of these copepods that we actually feed to the fish. So we have to maintain an adult population 
at the right, in the right conditions that they reproduce themselves and we take the babies and feed the babies to the fish. But we can't only feed the babies to the fish because eventually these adult copepods aren't going to be around anymore. So we have to grow up some of them to be new adult copepods to keep producing the, the babies. So the production of copepods is a much more complicated system for marine fish and that's something we're spending a lot of time trying to simplify and streamline and come up with a method and a protocol that can be adapted to a number of different conditions. What's the source of the copepod? Uh, right now we've um, we collected them initially from the wild so we collected them from the wild but now we've domesticated them so we have our own cultured strain stock yeah and so we have a stock that we've actually had in culture for over 10 years now that we basically are just maintaining, yeah. Those copepods, do, do they live within the, the marine environment, for example, like in the sand or? No, they, they live in the open ocean. Open ocean? Yeah, so uh, these particular ones are near shore copepods, but they, they swim around in the water, they eat algae and reproduce. And copepods are probably the primary prey source for most marine fish when they first hatch. This is the natural prey for most marine fish. <clears throat> the rotifers are not. Rotifers are a brackish water uh, plankton that the marine fish would probably never encounter in the wild, but th some of them do eat them, and they're a good substitute for copepods for some species of fish. So they're all over the Pacific Ocean? Yeah. Yeah, copepod, there's tens of thousands of species. Uh, they all have different life histories. This particular one is one that we've pretty much been working with for the past 10 years and have resolved uh, it's, it's life history. We know that from a nauplii to an adult is about eight days. Um, so at eight days they become adults. They can reproduce for about a week. And then after a week they pretty much become senescent. They only live for about 20 days and then they die. So we have to maintain a population of animals that are always in that eight day to 15 day old period that are always reproducing for us. So we can take the nauplii to feed and then we always are producing new adults to go back. So this is kind of a, a diagram to illustrate this cycle. <clears throat> if you start off with nauplii, which are the baby copepods, if you stock them, say 10 per milliliter into a flask, over time the number of nauplii are going to go down because they're maturing. So um, they're not necessarily dying, they're just turning into copepidites and adult copepods. They don't all live, but so after a period of time you'll see adult copepods, not very many nauplii. Then you'll see the, uh, all of a sudden at about eight to nine days there's a huge spike in nauplii because the adults are now reproducing. So you have a lot of, you'll have a lot of nauplii being produced with just a few uh, adults, but then some of these will start aging and then the, the nauplii will go away and you'll have more adults. So this is the cycle for parvocalanus. It's not the same for all copepods. Um, so because we know this kind of life history, we maintain a population that are in this region of production all the time. So and how we do that is we maintain stock cultures in small flasks that we just always re, uh, replenish. So. Um, these are protected and they're kept away from everything else so they don't get contaminated with other plankton or other, uh, other organisms. Then we, <coughs> we uh, grow up some nauplii and uh, we harvest them into a net, just like a plankton net. Some of those nauplii um, become future broodstock and some of them go into a production system to produce more nauplii. So this whole copepod um, production is a, a, a whole separate side component to marine fish hatchery <laughs> uh, production. And it's something that's, that needs to be worked on and improved still because it's still very labor intensive. And the amount of copepods you can get out is still really the limiting factor for how many marine fish you can grow. Yeah. I got a question. Mm -hmm. Would for example, if you have a system of uh, produ producing uh, marine aquaculture, and would the existence of uh, copepod be copepod be available? For example, if uh, 
we access, like we run, for example, a, a pipe system out into the open ocean, and instead of refiltering the water in a in a uh, um, closed environment, mm -hmm. okay, and you're basically creating a, a the environment for them, but instead. We utilize, because we have a broad open ocean out there, we utilize the open sea to pump the fresh ocean and then the, the, the old ocean water is pumped right back out mm -hmm. into the open ocean again. And therefore, the, the viability of the, the coping pot will be freshly injected into the environment of your aquaculture, a marine aquaculture system. The, the problem with that, that possible? It's, it's, it's possible. The problem is that the copepods don't exist at the right density out there oh. to support the density of fish you're probably going to try to rear. So you, see. in aquaculture, you're ha we have much higher densities of fry in a much smaller environment than they have in the wild. Okay. And so the, the, you would have to um, filter, the, you'd, have to, yeah, you'd have to take, you'd have to, yeah, you'd, yeah. Right. Right. Uh, right. There wouldn't be enough food available. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's yeah. And also, the copepods in the wild are not consistent. They uh, bloom up and down, right. and so you wouldn't have a consistent availability of feed if you were relying on the production in okay. the wild. Okay. Some places in the some places in the world is actually very seasonal. Like right. in temperate regions, the copepods bloom only once a year, and you know. <laughs> So here it's not like that, but um, you wouldn't necessarily have consistent availability. And then the last problem with that is if you don't filter the water coming in, you could introduce all kinds of other things into your system that you don't right, want right, right. in there. Yeah. And you yeah. would have to fill out a lot of paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, you can go to the next. Yeah. yeah. So by, uh, even though copepods are a huge uh, pain in some regards for producing them, they make a big difference in the production of some species of marine fish. So what this figure shows you is the survival percentage and the age um, and of uh, different species. But if you follow the green, if you only fed them algae, didn't feed them any prey, uh, pretty much after six or seven days, the animals will starve. They cannot, the fish cannot survive on just algae. If you fed them the algae and rotifers, which is the red line, you can see pretty much the same pattern. The fish cannot eat the rotifers. But if you feed them copepods, um, after seven days, now we have half of them living. <laughs> and so this has been the same pattern we've seen with snapper, trevally, and other coral reef species. So um, having the copepods is really important for some types of marine fish. And so um, we've developed a protocol uh, for applying um, uh, this this um, mechanism. So here's the length um, and the, the kind of just the growth curve of a fish and this is the age in days. So typically when you start the marine hatchery the fish for the first couple days they don't eat right so you don't have to have any food in the tank. About two days in we normally put algae and we now put the copepod nauplii and then in some cases, if we don't have a lot of nauplii being produced, you can actually add the adult copepods into the tank. And because you have algae in the tank, the adult copepods will actually reproduce in the tank. And the fish larvae can't eat the adult copepods because they're too big. So the adult copepods will reproduce in the tank. And um, at the very end, when the fish get big enough, they can also eat rotifers, then brine shrimp, and then dry feed. And that's kind of the standard protocol and by day 30. Uh, we can harvest them out of the hatchery. So in some cases. Uh, some cases, uh, like the other coral reef species, like the angelfish and the yellow tang, they have 60 or 90 day hatchery period. <laughs> so this goes on much longer. Okay. Uh, but by using this approach, we've been able to rear uh, a number of different species. So amberjack, you know, from egg all the way up to adult. The threadfin, which is the moi from egg all the way to adult, snapper, same, and uh, flame angelfish, which is a, the reef species, uh, the same. In the case of the angelfish, the adult is very small, <laughs> but the, uh, the other fish are much larger. 
Um, and so the, so the method does work and it's applied to different species across uh, the board. And so um, that's why with the rabbit fish project that we're starting at that uh, the college in Saipan, we're applying similar protocols to the rabbit fish uh, there. So once we have our, our fish out of the hatchery, grow out is the next big obstacle. And depending on which fish you're working with, you're gonna grow them out different ways. Um, uh, the moi and the amberjack usually are transported uh, in the big trucks, uh, tanks on the backs of big trucks, to uh, harbors where cranes have to lift the tanks onto a boat, and then the boat takes the tank out to the net pen, and then they're drained from the tank into the net pen offshore. So this is very logistically challenging, very costly, involves lots of moving parts as far as labor. Um, you can grow them out on shore in tanks if you have you know, the ability to do that. Or in Hawaii, we also have um, these lagoons, the Hawaiian fish ponds, where some of our fingerlings are grown out in the fish ponds. Um, and the, the thing to remember with grow out is that depending on what species you're working with, you're looking at six months to maybe two years of growing the fish before their market size. So um, you know, it's a big time commitment. So the hatchery side is, is relatively short in comparison to the grow out period. Okay, go ahead. Um, but the, the good news is, is that the nursery performance or the grow out um, survival is usually very high. So again, this, this table just shows you over multiple runs how many fish uh, we stocked, how many fingerlings we harvested. So this was actually at the hatchery at Oceanic Institute. So um, we have the ability to produce hundreds of thousands of fingerlings at a time. And so normally we'd stock three to 400,000 fish. And you can see, so the average is about 300,000, harvest is about 290,000. So over the course of a year, more than a million fingerlings went out to those cages, um, with the survival being 87%. So once they get through that initial hatchery phase, the survival is usually quite high. So then it's just a, then it's just a question of growing them and growing them economically. And feed, at this point, becomes the biggest cost because you have all of the fish, you have fish out there and you're dumping, basically throwing money into the water. <laughs> and so if you don't, if you don't apply that correctly, you can have a big difference in your bottom line profit. Well, that's, uh, some years ago, I think, we went there together. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went to uh, a shining mm -hmm. uh, they were experimenting on using, you know, juvenile, mm -hmm. the yellow yeah. thing, skin check, the yellow thing. And mm -hmm. the idea was to grow them and then let them out of the Wow, that? So, uh, yeah, we, we are not doing that right now. Uh, the state has taken over the stock enhancement program. But one aspect of aquaculture could be to produce fry for release um, into the nearshore environment. And places like Florida and Texas and Louisiana do that in the Gulf of Mexico quite successfully. And so it enhances the local population of fish. Um, You'd, the return on that for an individual is not very great, but that's where a state-funded hatchery or uh, something like that would be useful because it, um, you know, you're producing fish that are going to be released and it's for everyone's benefit. It's not just for one company's benefit. Um, so these are the different grow-out mechanisms we talked about: the submerged cage, tanks on shore, uh, or like Hawaiian fish pond traditional way of rearing fish. Um, and we're, we're currently working with the fish pond folks right now. We're trying to develop mullet hatchery technology again to supply mullet into the hatchery, into the uh, fish ponds. Uh, and then like you were just mentioning, wild fishery enhancement is another tool that could be used for aquaculture. So, um, so restoring uh, the nearshore environment by releasing fish is one uh, one mechanism that a lot of people are interested in. I know the Saipan DLNR expressed interest with that with the rabbit fish uh, as well. And they're doing that in Palau. In Palau, there's a hatchery that produces rabbit fish up to about a month old, and then they release them out into the ocean to augment the population. Uh, <clears throat> so um, some of the advantages of open ocean aquaculture. 
are that um, we have abundant resources in the water. If we use native species that are indigenous to the area, we don't have any concern about releasing. Um, we have fast growing conditions because we have good tropical conditions year round. We have uh, site locations that have access to deep water that are near shore. So these cages, uh, in order to have enough water flowing past them, typically need to be in relatively deep water and fast flowing currents. So you don't want to have these cages near shore in a lagoon where there's not a lot of water exchange. You're going to foul the water really quickly. But Saipan is similar to Hawaii in the fact that there's deep water near shore. And so you can have these cages in really clean, fast moving water not too far out. And there's a, you know, being out of sight of the boats, poaching out of sight of the, out of the surface conditions is really an advantage as well. So the results of what we've done in Hawaii is basically led to um, development of broodstock, live feeds, hatchery technology for both the moi and the kahala or the amberjack. We've demonstrated the hatchery production technologies for these two species and how they can be applied to other species as well. The directly resulted in the formation of two companies, Hukilau Foods and Kona Blue, both of which have been kind of bought and sold a few times uh, since, the, since their inception, uh, were the direct result of this investment in research. Um, and so similar uh, realizations could be found elsewhere, you know? Um, so we think there's a lot of potential for this type of technology. Um, a while back, I was asked to kind of think about what opportunities might be out there for CNMI. So in addition to the open ocean aquaculture, which I do think is a possibility here, there's a number of different species that are being produced in other parts of the world, in, in, in other Pacific islands, specifically coral um, and giant clams for the aquarium industry. Um, I know people like to eat the giant clams for food, but they actually have a very high value to the aquarium market because of their bright color uh, mantles. And so places in, like in Palau and in Fiji are starting to culture them uh, only up to a small size, and then they sell them for a relatively high price per unit. Um, so that's something that could easily be done here, you know, as well as coral and uh, rock production for aquarium industry. Uh, and aquarium species of fish too. Really, really high value species that are relatively small. Um, but there's also high value species like grouper and snapper and trevally that, that could be cultured here as well. So really the opportunities are, are whatever you want to make of it. There, you have the resources here, you just need to uh, um, start fostering the growth. Okay. So that leads into the project that we're working on at the Saipan Hatchery. Um, was supported by the Marine Conservation Plan, and it was to target the production of uh, Cygnus argentus, the uh, forktail rabbit fish. We had a stakeholder meeting last August, what's 2012? For the start of the rabbit fish? Oh yeah, the end of the CTSA project, okay. So we had a stakeholder meeting that identified um, rabbit fish as the most desirable species at least uh, to the population that was at the meeting, represented largely from folks on Saipan. Um, but uh, they identified this as a high potential candidate for aquaculture for a number of reasons. One is that it's a herbivore, so uh, relatively easy to culture using lower cost feed once you get the juveniles produced. It's important to the near shore environment <coughs> because it removes algae, so it's a from a conservation point of view, it was important to culture that. And also it had a wide range of markets. The marketability of the small uh, fry as an actual final product all the way up to the market size for meat. Um, so uh, that's why this species was chosen. Go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Can I ask Mike a question? Sure. Might be a uh, rabbit fish and there are different varieties, right? Which one are you culturing? The the, uh, uh, the or the what do we mean by eating? That's a smaller one. No, no, eating is the bigger one. The answer. Oh, it's so it's uh, mm -hmm. the grapefruit or the argentus. Yeah. The argentus. yeah. <coughs> what do we mean? Argentus, yeah. Eating, eating. right? Yeah. It's eating with argentus. So one of the first things that we um, needed to do 
to get the capacity going for rabbitfish was to convert existing systems that were at the college that were primarily used for shrimp and tilapia into being used for marine finfish. <clears throat> and one of the biggest things that needed to be uh, done was the improvement in the filtration system just to provide that cleaner water that we talked about that the marine fish need compared to the tilapia. And so we, uh, over the period since last August and now have been redesigning and retrofitting the systems, uh, putting in new filtration and uh, mechanical filtration and UV and biofiltration into the systems there. Um, and basically the end result is uh, two functional uh, improved systems, a larval rearing system and a broodstock holding system. The water you use might not say that. Is that the practice water? So they have a, they have a saltwater well. From the ocean? No, they drill the saltwater well on the campus. And so they pump the water uh, from a, directly from a saltwater well. And so uh, once the systems were um, designed and modified, uh, we employed uh, some local fishermen in Saipan to help us collect the rabbit fish. They were far more efficient at it than I would have been or Mike <laughs> at collecting the fish. And they actually were able to collect 95 uh, adult size uh, rabbit fish for us. And um, they did this uh, by using boats at night and they would go out to the lagoon at night and use the lights and the divers would go down and scoop net the fish. They would keep them in uh, these traps and then in the morning could transfer them to uh, the college. And uh, by doing that, it was very efficient. We got uh, 95 fish. And so I, I would say that was a good success in recruiting the, the rabbit fish, yeah. yeah I, I assume that that would be the most cost-effective way of getting your roots up because I am an experienced diver here and rotor myself. And, mm. and the nice thing about those rabbit fish is that when you spot them at night, they just park themselves along the, the, the rock mm -hmm. and the coral. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for you to use the scoop net. Yeah, yeah. So the one thing that we did learn was that the, they're very sensitive to abrasions. And so the, if we did this again in the future, we would probably try to design different nets uh, that are more soft and more gentle on the fish because they got quite beat up in the process of being collected and transferred back to the college. So there was quite a bit of mortality associated with the abrasions on the fish. Um, but even with that mortality, we still have a population that's uh, healthy at the college now. And uh, so once the broodstock were collected, they were weighed and measured. So we knew how big they were when we first brought them here. Uh, you can see this is one uh, animal in a person's hand. So you can see roughly the size. They were mostly roughly about one pound in size, right? Uh, the largest one was uh, 13 inches. 13 inches. Yeah, yeah, about one and a half pounds, so pretty big. And uh, only maybe two or three months after putting them into the uh, tanks, uh, we were mon the Mike's uh, workers, student workers, have been monitoring the egg collection, and we s we have eggs. All these little dots are eggs. We were very happy after looking at them under the microscope to actually see them developing into embryos. So they're actually our fertilized eggs, really viable and ready to hatch. So. Um, that's kind of where the project is right now. We've gotten the fish to spawn and they produce eggs, but we haven't yet really been successful in rearing the larvae. So we're hoping that Mike uh, can get continued funding because the project is basically over now. Uh, we're hoping to get continued funding so we can work on the larval rearing of these fish at the college and demonstrate the complete production of the fingerlings. The next funding cycle will be the larval grow out yeah and we talked about possibly the idea would be if the college could produce the fingerlings if there were farmers that were interested in growing the fingerlings uh, they would have to have access to seawater but they could grow them up in in uh, seawater systems in, in there either if they have access to the near shore or uh, surface pens or something like that they could grow them up like that or maybe even in tanks in their yard yeah the municipality is tanks here probably would need some minor repair, uh, ocean waters nearby, so okay. that's possible, yep. uh, a rollout demonstration. Okay, you have a question? Yeah. For example, uh, if you produce the, the eggs uh, in a controlled environment, mm -hmm. the rabbit fish, 
get the root stuck and you produce the eggs to that stage and then uh, it, would it be viable if we, for example, take the eggs and put them in a, a actual marine environment and in a, a controlled marine environment. Mm -hmm. And for example, here in Rota, we, we can uh, designate like a water, for example, out there, mm -hmm. and then have them thrive in that natural circulating marine environment. Mm -hmm. It's possible. The question is if there's enough food available for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, with the with the these animals, with these larvae, we think the rotifers will be uh, sufficient, but we won't have to produce copepods for them. Um, I, I I have si I've witnessed that. For example, the, the rabbit fish here in Iwata, I, I they I mean thousands of them. Mm -hmm. I mean they're all over. They're like. Like, you know, when the typhoon hits, hits and all the leaves are in the water? Yeah, yeah, like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, but those are, those are juveniles, though. And, I mean, they grow like to this size, yeah. and then uh, after that, they kind of like spread uh, out. Spread out, yeah. I guess, uh, foraging for food. But yep. I've seen them in that kind of uh, uh, quantity, yep. mass quantity right in. I think, I think that we would want to get them to uh, post larval size and then put them there. So, not necessarily stocking the eggs in that environment, but actually get them through the first few weeks of their larval stages right, right. And then put them in there yeah and that could be a test that you, you do so okay next so that's my last slide uh, from the presentation